Okay, now that we talked a bit about the concept of happens before relationships, let's give some examples, and hopefully this will make it a little bit more clear with looking at concrete examples, what, what is actually going on here. And we'll focus on some examples in the context of uh, Java thread methods, as well as collection methods, so you can see happens before relates to multiple things. So, as you probably remember, Java threads have a whole bunch of methods. And some of these methods will establish happens before relationships. And we'll take a look at some examples here. So, starting a thread clearly happens before the run hook method is called. So, the, the method, when you say start on a thread, that will create another thread. And the thread has to be initialized before it starts to run. Otherwise, chaos and insanity would break out, right? If you started the thread, the thread hadn't been fully initialized, the thread object had not been fully initialized, and its run method starts to run, you'd be in big trouble because it wouldn't be properly initialized. So that's one of the places where it happens before a relationship occurs. So here's a simple example. We have thread B, which is going to be set to this particular lambda expression, just printing out a value, we're printing a hello world. We start this, so we create thread B, we start thread B from within thread A, and this is the run hook method that gets called. And the point here is that the call to the start method and any changes that may make to the shared state will happen before and complete the initialization before the run hook method is called. That, that seems pretty obvious, right? But if you didn't have the semantics of the Java memory model, you'd be, you have no guarantees that that would be the case. Likewise, the state of thread B will be consistent and visible before it starts to execute. So that's just saying everything will be initialized properly. The inverse of this, or the converse of this, is where the termination of a thread happens before a join with the terminated thread. So after we start thread B from within thread A, thread B goes off and does something or other, and then join gets called. And the point here is that run will finish and any state will be propagated that run may have had as a side effect to all the, the threads. So when join is called, it will see the updated state that thread B may have made on shared mutable state within that process. So here's an example. Again, we go ahead and spawn a thread. We go ahead and print something out. And after it prints out hello world, thread B is going to terminate after run falls off the end. And so thread B will well, this, this call will block until thread B is really finished running, at which point thread A will continue on doing its thing. And when thread A continues doing its thing, any state that's changed will be seen in thread A. Any, any state that was changed here in thread B will be visible in thread A. So what it says here, after join returns, thread A must see all the changes made to the shared state by thread B that happened before it exited. Again, it seems like a pretty obvious thing we're just codifying the meaning of these particular methods and giving them semantics that are consistent and valid in the context of a uh, multi-threaded program on multiple core processors. There are also methods within concurrent collections that have the same types of properties. So we'll look, for example, at some of the concurrent collection methods focusing on concurrent hash map. Let's start off with something a little bit more general, though. Uh, the release of a monitor lock happens before every subsequent acquire on the same lock. So let's say we had thread A and thread B. So we come in here, we acquire the lock. So we're doing something here. This, this could either be a synchronized statement or it could be a, a rantrant lock for that matter. And, uh, or a, a spin lock like you guys wrote. So in here, this is locked. This guy comes along. Um, and so, what is it saying here? Released lock by A happened before B got it. Right, so this is saying that when, assuming that A gets locked before B, this guy's gonna be waiting for this lock to unlock the lock, and when this lock is released, then any change that happened to be made in this synchronized statement 
will then be available in thread B when it acquires the lock. So again, it's just saying that changes that happen before this lock is acquired will be correctly propagated over to thread B so it can see any changes to the shared mutable state. And that's a little bit more subtle. I think you have to think more about that to make sure that that makes sense, but that's really important. And here's an example of where this would be relevant. So we're going to have uh, array blocking Q, and here's thread A. It's going to do a put. Here's uh, thread B. It's going to do a take. So let's take a look at these two things. We've seen this before. Let's say for sake of argument that um, this guy comes in and acquires the lock, and he's doing the take. So for sake of argument, let's say the queue is empty. So this lock is held, and this lock has got to be released and any changes to the shared state must be propagated before um, acquiring of the lock and unlocking this lock. So in this particular case, this lock, let's say if this guy goes first, he has to unlock the lock before this guy can make progress here and any state that's changed inside of thread A will be propagated to thread B. Similar kinds of semantics happen with concurrent hash map. This is even more subtle though because Unlike the example here where we might just care about one value in one field, for some of the stuff here we have multiple values that are in a tuple like an entry in the concurrent hash maps entry set. And so we have to make sure those things are all done consistently and atomically. So here's an example. We make ourselves a new concurrent hash map. We come along in thread one, we put a key value pair into the map, and that putting has to finish atomically. Both the key and the value have to show up. It has to, has to be quiesced. It has to be then pushed out to other threads such that if thread two comes along and then gets that key, it'll get the value that was put in here in thread T1. And without the assurance of happens before relationships, you could end up with the key visible but not the value. The good news is, you know, a lot of this stuff is rather subtle. The good news is you don't have to think too much about this in general because it's handled for you by the locks that are part of the underlying Java collections. And they support, obviously, uh, mutual exclusion. They support atomicity. They support coordination. They support barrier synchronization. And so as long as you understand these higher level concepts, higher level classes, a lot of the lower level stuff about happens for relationships are just taken care of for you. So you don't have to think too much about what's going on under the hood.